Mindful of this guy. Oh, can I maybe just scoot over six inches or so? That'd be great. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I said at least don't abort it <laughs> completely because. No, we're using my room. I brought the stand. So oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we brought it. It was upstairs in the room. Well, I got to tell the people upstairs too. Well, Stay with their mic too. Well, I'm trying to put it right in front of their face so that. Is there one upstairs now? There's not a lever there. There's there's a hardware. Yeah. Stand. Yeah. As long as it's aiming at them right near the podium, that's mm -hmm. generally where they'll be because their laptops are right there. So okay, I'm gonna go turn on upstairs real quick so I don't miss out on the start. Thank you. started here. Uh, my name is Aaron Evans. I've been around the AppSec uh, community since the end of the 90s. Um, and so this is kind of a, uh, a new interesting area for me because most of the last 15 years I've been focused on vulnerabilities in, in source code or inside of applications. Um, and as part of setting out to figure out what bad guys are exploiting in our apps now and monetizing, uh, we've kind of dipped into this whole new threat landscape of malvertising and malware applications. We'll talk about that in a bit. So, so my background is coming from the AppSec side of the house, and this is James. How you doing? I'm James Plugger, so I'm the head of research over at RiskIQ as well. Um, so basically my focus has been on a lot of security on the defensive side, so it's been mostly on detecting things, so a lot of network-based intrusion stuff as well as you know, random different ways to help them attack the service. So. so that was us. I'd like to get an idea of who's in this room. And we're really unsure the demographic, um, which will influence what we spend most of the time on. So, so who here actually manages an AppSec program for an organization? One person managing uh, SDLC, SDLC guidance. Okay. Uh, who here is an actual AppSec pen tester or source code review person? Uh, who's an app designer or developer that's looking for info on more secure coding? Uh, who here is a consultant? 
a little bit of all of that. Okay. So, who are the other two thirds of you? <laughs> So I'm curious, are there any other titles that are here that I, that I missed or roles and responsibility? Yeah. yeah malware detection on websites, malvertising. Okay. Oh, so you're actually into that space. Okay. Oh, so we have a whole mix here. This will be interesting. So uh, this actually wasn't the presentation I built for OWASP. I had another one about the SDLC, which is, I guess it turned out to be as boring as, as the subject sounds like. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, we were collecting this data, and, and James and I and others have been working on, on building this app, and we submitted it. Uh, probably to force ourselves to put this data together. Um, and we're surprised to find that the, the votes for this are actually much, much higher, probably because it's a new topic, um, and possibly because it's so complex. So this looks like more of a tennis shoes than a sport coat crowd. So I, I'll stop there, so don't get worried. I'm not taking <laughs> this off. So, so a quick outline, we're going to go through mistaken assumptions. Those are mine, not James's. Uh, when we first got into analyzing the internet and organizations and collecting this data, I walked in with some very boring assumptions. Uh, we're going to talk about a general malvertising overview and then the study we did this fall on malvertising campaigns and data. Uh, we're going to talk about some high-tech examples. We're going to talk about low-tech examples. And then James is going to walk you through the ad ecosystem and explain why this is so complicated. Uh, and then James, depending on our time, will take you through some campaigns and show you how they're distributing malware and how they obfuscate and hide it behind all these layers and what we call TDSs. Well, let's move this back. Yeah. All right. So mistaken assumptions I made, this is horrible, I can't be either here. <clears throat> mistaken assumptions I made, first of all, I thought web uh, malware attacks are primarily custom and sophisticated. And this is because what I've studied so far, um, what I've talked to or worked with organizations about are things like Aurora or Shady Rat. They were very highly sophisticated, like long-term, sometimes state actor campaigns. I also thought that the mobile threat landscape was similar, and that I thought most of what's going on on mobile in terms of compromise is driven around malware, uh, or just you know misuse of privileges and permissions that can be abused. I thought ad network attacks were mostly brute force, uh, and things like cat picture signatures or email. And basically, I thought this stuff was only for people like my mother. So, you know, you target people with really good defenses like Google, you got to be super sophisticated. You target my mom. And, and then this, you know, I didn't really, uh, didn't really have any data or understand it that much. So, what did we actually learn from, from data after we got done collecting this? What we found is that uh, web malware attacks are vast and varied. That's probably not too surprising. Um, what we found actually was probably even less surprising was that low tech attacks uh, trumped high tech sophisticated attacks, but just by orders of magnitude, exponential. Like when we chart them, you can't even see the high tech attacks versus the low tech attacks on bar graph. Uh, the mobile threatscape is actually huge, and it's more similar to the malvertising threat landscape than like highly technical, sophisticated attacks. It's really not about malware. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of privileged mistakes out there with legitimate applications, but it's a small fraction of what's out there. And so for example, uh, does anybody remember the snapping that happened to Snapchat last year? And there were a lot of news and media about it. So we were like, well, what, you know, why is this so challenging for, for them? Like, why can't you go out there and just kind of remove some of the rogue stuff and lock down your API? And we went out there, and our, our initial look, we found roughly 674 applications that were impersonating Snapchat, just in the mobile stores alone. And then we found far exceeding that on the web. We just quit counting on the web. So, so the lesson there is like, okay, well, Snapchat, you know, they can secure their own app or maybe do things. There might be a few apps out there with malware. I think we found two or three with malware in them. But the general problem is this huge amount of stuff that's just doing brand impersonation. Is there money to be made in this? You know, years ago, Jeremiah and I and a, another gentleman put together some presentations. We went out and researched the web and said, how, how much money are people making exploiting web applications? Well, this Get Rich or Die Trying presentation. We're pretty amazed to find people were making it into seven figures. And I didn't realize this ecosystem had matured that much. So when we went out and we found examples like Eurograbber, um, the group behind Eurograbber has done a couple of campaigns around malvertising and fake apps predominantly mobile because they targeted Europe and mobile apps are big in Europe and essentially they made banking apps like a mint.com they made apps that looked 
nicer, more highly functional in some cases than the banking apps. So they were compelling for the user experience, but unlike Mint.com, they actually weren't funded by legitimate parties. So once they get a critical mass of users, then they would siphon money out. So the, the Eurograbber campaign alone, they made 47 million. Uh, and the Ukraine's interior ministry, the group split between Ukraine and Russia, they estimated it's stolen over 250 million in the last three or four years. So there's like serious big dollars out there in these campaigns. And the other thing I found out is that it actually isn't just this, this you know, high noise to signal shotgun approach of like, you know, dancing animated cats and gifts for email kind of stuff. They're actually very sophisticated ways they target. So the people who are doing, using uh, malvertising and, and in a similar concept mobile, but a pretty good with malvertising, they're actually becoming parts of the ad ecosystem. And they'll go out and actually buy demographics and then start inserting ads. For example, um, I can go out and profile 50-year-old white males who drive Cadillacs or upper you know, middle class, have a lot of cash in the bank, that have a high likelihood of downloading the Tulsa Wanamaker gun show discount apps, <laughs> right? If I throw down out there a large, like probably, you know, spend a lot of money to get maybe a .001%, I'll even download it. Look at that thing. And a tech savvy user knows that a cash only gun show isn't going to take a mobile app discount. So you need a fairly unsophisticated person with cash, etc. Point is you can profile all these specific demographics and very cost effectively go after this small target with a high likelihood of exploit access. So it's really an optimization network. So malvertising overview. Malvertising, we believe, is the fastest growing and least understood attack vector in the AppSec world today. We've seen an exponential increase uh, in campaigns just in the last year. We know that attackers are getting away with substantial amounts of money. Um, the Organizations we deal with, the vast majority of folks we talk to, there's no real tools to measure and manage the malvertising space and in general the whole mobile landscape and rogue app landscape. And what I mean by that is, uh, I said we touched on this, you have, you have really three kinds of applications you care about. You have things that you own that you know about, and then any of you do pen testing or an AppSec program that your company also has a marketing department. You have things that you own that you don't know about that no one tells you about, that you have to figure out where they are and find them. Um, and then you have a third thing out there, which is rogue applications that look like yours, but aren't really your applications. Those could be rogue ads, rogue mobile apps. So classifying those is tough. And the problem is big enough, uh, the US Senate commissioned, uh, uh, put together a commission just to try to investigate this because of the amount of financial fraud going on with it. So it's a pretty big deal. What's the problem? I mean, this is a pretty basic slide. I think you get it. The, you know, the online advertising infrastructure was shockingly not built for security. So uh, you, you guys can hold out. I mean, hold, hold your breaths. <laughs> so uh, and and there's very little regulation. In fact, there's really not much in the way of governance or tools in the entire online advertising. I mean, you know, some of the people who who are behind some of the, some of the online advertising networks, you know, there's a certain amount of fraud that's in part of their business model. So it's hard to police something that has a lot of shading that's going on in it inherently. And the danger there is really, you know, all the layers we'll get into later mean that anybody can put malvertisements on any website at any given time. So sizing it, well, all the free internet, we know a big chunk of it is power by this infrastructure. In terms of dollars today, it's a $545 billion industry and growing pretty rapidly. So there's a lot of dollars in there. I mean, very small percentage to siphon off to make a, a big difference in your lifestyle. So what do we find when we went out there as far as the attack vectors that people are using to target customers and users? So what we found were the top three things were actually fake software. So you know, instead of going to hack a secure application, you know, many organizations are getting better and better at securing their applications. It's much easier to compromise the user by giving them a fake application. And especially with the presence of open APIs on the internet and all this, if you get the user to log into a fake app and point them at an API, it is now the legitimate client, whoever mobile, that they're using for this. So fake branded software updates was number one. Fake generic software was number two. Fake antivirus software was number three. And then the technical exploit kits, the high-tech attacks, were four and five. So we didn't even put four and five on the bar graph because you, you can't see them on the lines. The difference between you know, fake branded software and the technical exploit kit used. Um, so that's pretty fascinating. And so 
what do we mean by these in example? So brand impersonating fake software typically, so you could have a fake application, a web or mobile for like a Snapchat site, or more often a fake software update. People are used to updating now, download, you know, updates, could be a security update, whatever. Generic Trojan software presents like this. You just get some arbitrary executable. You get some ad, you come to a site, maybe you're trying to get a discount for progressive insurance, and it's like, do you want to run this thing? They don't even try to be smart about it. It's just actually the Mozilla download page. So the Mozilla download page. So you go to Mozilla.org and you expect to download Firefox, and in the background, an advertisement shows up with a Firefox setup executable download. You know, it's exactly what you're expecting on the page that you're expecting it. And because it's delivered through an ad, you have no idea. Uh, you have no idea that it actually is malicious. I mean, how do you explain that to your grandmother or your mother, uh, you know, when you're trying to clean up their computer? Like, don't download things you don't know from the internet, and they've just downloaded it off of Mozilla's website. So it's very difficult for some of these things to uh, kind of identify and, and really figure out. And then you add the layers of complexity inside the ad ecosystem on top of that, and it just becomes a nightmare to try to figure out you know, where it came from. So, so we're 15 minutes in. Sorry, All right. we'll get through Sorry. this. Okay. So, um, so we can get to the example. So so, so one, one suggestion I do have here is if you are dealing with your mom or grandmother and they go to the Firefox site, just tell them, make sure you only download and run the right Firefox executable. <laughs> Uh, fake AV software, you know, I, I was surprised how all these things work. I typically, you know, kind of ignore that whole world, but clearly it works because there's a ton of it. And then, what was the one you told me about that they're doing now? Oh, it was, you are, yeah. So James pointed out that the thing that's rising now, so they've kind of been milking, uh, you know, the crap out of the, the fake AV software. So the new campaigns they're running are, you have fake AV software, so this will remove the fake AV software we got you to download last time. Because we're here to help. So, so now, so um, I really didn't have a lot of value in this presentation other to express my ignorance at the beginning and talk about what I learned. Now we're going to get into the more technical part of the presentation and I'm going to hand it over to the question or or okay. to the end. Uh, if, if they're real quick, because we, yeah. Um, what does smart screen and Google safe browsing do to all that? Um, Good question. Yeah, so real quick, um, everything that we scan with our system, we actually submit to Google safe browsing. Uh, we've noticed uh, on average that we pick a lot of this stuff up uh, way before Google safe browsing uh, you know, picks it up. So we actually see, like, sometimes It'll be a week, sometimes it'll be two weeks. Uh, it just depends on what it is. Uh, they normally pick it up, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we see that actually doesn't get picked up by Google Safe Browsing. We've been trying to work with them on like, you know, enhancing their product, uh, but it, it's kind of a difficult thing. There's so much stuff out there that you know, it's very difficult to, to do with. So. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Kind of, sort of? Okay. So yes, it is helping slowly. But I mean, the, the amount of stuff out there, I mean, the question is what, how much are you moving the needle? It's, it's yeah, that, that's a block list. Uh, smart screen says, no, don't install that if it's never heard of it. Yeah, and that's, that's the big problem. I mean, we submit a lot of stuff. Uh, we're in for the top five uh, ad exchanges. So we scan a lot of ads every single day. So there's a lot of data that they get from us regarding like new campaigns that are going on. So a lot of times what will happen is we'll block a advertisement in the second exchange. And then what will happen is, you know, it'll be blocked in that exchange, but they'll move on to shadier and shadier uh, ad networks or ad exchanges, and then they'll display it. And hopefully by then, uh, you know, we've given a few days where we've blocked it with some of the larger partners, and then by then hopefully they've you know, blocked it inside Google Safe Browsing or something like that. And it kind of diminishes the effectiveness of their campaigns. So uh, I don't have raw numbers, you know, to, to show how that's, you know, helped with that, but you know, a, a little down sometimes can, you know, a lot. So, so let's, get into the, let's get into the technical examples. Yeah. So one of the things that we we had, uh, and he, he, he mentioned it earlier, so like the fake software, you know, these social engineering attacks, uh, they're literally like 90% 
95% of the problem that we have in the advertising ecosystem. Uh, some of the more example, uh, the more advanced examples that we have, uh, you know, that, that really kind of were big last year uh, were both Angler uh, as well as the Rig Exploit Kits. Uh, now, everyone here, does everyone understand what an exploit kit is? Uh, I'm kind of assuming uh, that most folks will know what that is. Uh, you know, Angler targeted a lot of Silverlight, Flash, and Java. So pretty much anyone that was running some sort of vulnerable version uh, would be affected on that. Uh, you know, they kind of go after the uh, you know the lowest hanging fruit first. You know, so uh, if there's Silverlight, you know they'll pop it. You know they'll move on to Flash and Java. So a lot of times, what we'll have is basically uh, Angular will be a landing page. There will be a traffic distribution in front of it. So what happens is these guys, similar to the ad ecosystem, they want to target very specific browsers. So there's a distribution system in front of it. And basically, folks will you know say, you know, if it's an OS 10 box, don't even send it to the exploit kit. If it's you know a Linux box, don't do that either. I only want you know Internet Explorer 8 with these plugins, and then it'll go to that specific exploit kit. They can also do things like. Uh, I only want folks that are based out of the U.S. or Europe or something like that, where it's some sort of other demographic that they're looking for, uh, and then they'll they'll kind of push those guys to those kits. Uh, the other thing that we saw a lot of was the Rig Exploit Kit, um, and it's basically like kind of an evolution of a couple different other kits. Uh, sometimes this stuff gets misidentified uh, pretty often, but. You know, a lot of times what this is is it's a primer as a service sort of thing. So you pay them, you know, an X, X amount of dollars per month and they'll host it for you. You don't even have to maintain the exploits. You know, you just basically drop the payload and they load it onto people's systems. So there's some kind of interesting stuff there, but I'm going to skip that. Uh, so real quick, um, to understand the ad ecosystem uh, really helps you understand non-retasking. Uh, we mentioned earlier that this ecosystem is such a huge and complex thing that there's so many different points of entry. Uh, you know, right here is probably the simplest uh, slide that I can give you guys. So, it, if you look at this slide, basically the money flows towards the right. And on the far right, we have the audience, which is basically somebody at a, at a uh, computer viewing an ad. Uh, they get an ad display. Now. The publishers are going to be your sites that run the ads. So they're going to be your web applications, your, you know, flat papers, papers, whatever. Uh, they're going to be the guys that have this ad space that they're trying to sell. And normally what they have is they have some sort of ad server that then hooks up to a supply side platform. And the supply side platform basically says, I have this grouping of websites. So, you know, whether it be a tech site, uh, you know, game websites, things like that. And then they offer their inventory for sale on an exchange. And on these exchanges, you can think of it as like NASDAQ or the stock market. Uh, people say, I want to spend this much money on advertisements. And people say, I'll sell you this much inventory for this amount. Uh, and they have a thing called real time bidding, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, but it even makes things much more complicated. Uh, normally, what they do is they have some sort of optimization, which is when you get into demand side platforms. And then there's ad agencies as well as the actual end advertiser. So, you know, basically if I'm an advertiser, I spend my money uh, with, with an agency and everyone else gets a little cut of that money, you know, from every point down. And depending on what sort of targeting you're doing, so if you're targeting like a middle-aged, you know, person that's going to a gun show in, you know, Kansas or something like that, it's going to cost a lot more money than, let's say I buy crappy traffic and I want to display like, you know, 50 million impressions or something like that over the course of a month. That's going to cost me a lot less money than, you know, very targeted demographics. So, to, you know, that being said... So before we go on, let's go back to that slide. Yeah. That, does anybody have any questions about how this flows? Well, yeah. Just one question: Where does your company come in? Are you between the after the agency? So our company actually, so we do a lot of stuff. It really depends on uh, what sort of things the companies are. 
We actually can sit anywhere in this, um, pretty much past the publisher, uh, between the uh, DSP and the publisher. We're, we're, we're scanning the internet, doing discovery on all of this. And then paid by the agencies? Uh, we, we, we don't do work with the advertisers or the agencies. Um, pretty much anything past the DSP. We actually is, do we? Yeah. So I lied. So, <laughs> so, 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 so there is. It's, I, I'm a big fat liar. I'm sorry. <laughs> so are is it only the advertisers the slot where the, the uh, malware comes from, or are they some of these other guys in the middle and just? So there's actually tiers in here. There's multiple paths to get from here to here. Is where it gets tricky. So if the the most cost effective effective are the direct relationships and are the most profitable. The Actually, the cheapest for you, if you're a bad guy, is to go through the exchanges, but it's the least value. You know, think of it as you have some... Oh, and, and the big difficult issues. Uh, once you get closer to the publishers, you have to spend more money to get a display. So, let's say I have, I'm a small mom and pop company, and I have like a $2,000 budget. I could be an advertiser, go to an agency and say, spend this $2,000 uh, in this market, and they will do that. If I went to a publisher, like let's say I went to like, you know, a big site like Huffington Post or something like that, they're gonna laugh me out of the room because they're dealing with three, four hundred thousand dollar deals. Like if you don't have more than that, they aren't even gonna sell you anything. So so it so, so depends in, in the sense that some sites, think of it as real estate. If they have a property for that day or even that minute that they haven't had a direct relationship with, they'll work back and throw it on an exchange and you can buy it last minute. So some of the guys, some of the bad guys are buying up last minute real estate as it comes on the market super cheap. That's the random shotgun. You know, I mean they can dial it in a little bit. Some of the bad guys are coming back here and buying data here to figure out where to enter to optimize. They're paying a lot more money, but they know the return is much higher. They might be getting a, a 1 or a 10% return as opposed to a 0.001% return. The bad guys can enter in anywhere in here. We're out monitoring all this on the internet and then trying to figure out the, the attribution amongst other things. Um, but the, the, the bad guys can enter at multiple phases in here, which is why it's very important to figure out what that chain is. And then it's hard to point the finger, because if you get this guy to clean up his act, they might just come in over here. So. Are you, are you identifying that the, the actors are going through the entire life cycle, or are you identifying that they're actually compromising a specific node? So like so, attacking the ad server, penetrating that environment, and then distributing it, or? So here's the thing. Um, we've seen everything. Like, we've seen folks where they've compromised the ad servers. We've actually seen on the supply side platforms where they've compromised like the optimization stuff. Uh, we, we had like last year, uh, actually early 2014, uh, we're a huge supply side platform uh, company. They got breached, and we're serving up malware just everywhere. Uh, so know, we're, we're monitoring as virtual users. Yeah, we've got proxies all over the world and browsers all over the world emulating users all over the world. And we have to be very discreet about this. You can't come at it like a vulnerability scanner. So bad guys, most of them are very sophisticated. So if they realize who you are, just like saying, "Don't show this bad thing." Right? They try to minimize who sees bad stuff so they get a high likelihood of exploit. If you're like, that was a problem with Dacian, why they struggle. The minute they figure out who you are, you're not going to see anything bad ever again. So, Well, my question is along the same line. So how much are you seeing Black Hat SEO fitting into this? Right? And how do you differentiate between the two? I mean, three years ago, LA Times was hacked. right? And they immediately said, oh, it's mal malvertising. But then everyone said, no, 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 you're dishing it up. And they went and looked and said, oh, no, 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 it's still malvertising. They so, went back and looked again, and it ended up that they were owned, and they were dishing out Black Hat SEO. Yeah. And I'm trying not to turn this into a sales pitch or anything like that. I'm, I'm on the research side, so uh, I, I typically look at the data. Um, our main thing is we actually have our own browser, so we can actually see the exact call chains that occur. And what we have is, uh, so we track over 27,000 different ad uh, networks and exchanges. So this whole market, like from everyone running like their own OpenX server uh, to huge, huge exchanges, we track all of that stuff. So, so the answer yeah. is we have a pretty good sense yeah. of attribution on that. 
based upon tracing the whole call chain. Yeah. So people go, oh no, it wasn't. And it was like, well, no, it's yeah. Yeah, it, it is coming. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, and, and a little later, um, assuming I have time, I can kind of go through and kind of show you uh, how those call chains look. Uh, and we can actually go through and identify um, some of these different components, okay, assuming we have time. Mm -hmm. I can slow. So. Okay. So, real quick, um, unless there are any other questions on this slide. I, I Everyone good? Okay, okay cool. <laughs> um, so, I, I just wanted to go through and, and you know, give you guys kind of a really funny example of a really stupid, low-tech thing that actually works. So, we scan a bunch of different top sites, uh, and obviously some of the top sites are, you know, adult uh, themed sites. And what we see on a lot of the adult sites is we actually see this. Uh, and what it is is it's a browser locker. And what they're trying to do, uh, you can see the awesome English over here. Uh, attention, your browser has been blocked up for safety reasons. All the actions performed on this PC are fixed, period. All the files are encrypted. Audio and video recording in progress. Um, so, you know, obviously these guys don't speak English as their first language. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, there's some other really awesome text in there. Um, basically what they're trying to do is find folks that are visiting porn sites, and then they're trying to uh, convince them that they're somehow caught by the FBI. Uh, the FBI, NSA, uh, you know, whatever. They pretty much throw everything in there. And you guys saw the story like five or six days ago. I mean, he was a young kid. I could believe this. And oh, he killed himself. Yeah. I, I mean, 17 year old. And was he 17? I think it was talking yeah, they were still in high school, but yeah, for 14 so, like. you know, and basically what this does is it locks up your computer. You can't do anything. Because what it does is it actually puts about, I, I think, like 60 or 80 uh, different iframes in that all it does is lock it up and say, enter this money back number. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it, and this is really dumb. It works. You know, they wouldn't be running these ads if, if they didn't. Uh, so it's kind of a... Uh, an interesting tip that I can I can show more detail on that if anyone's interested, but I'll really quickly go into that. another example that we have, uh, which is actually going to be focused on the traffic distribution side. Um, so a while ago, what we ran across is uh, this TDS that we named. Uh, it's called Video Ad Banner, is what we call it uh, internally. So the problem. So a lot of the exploit kits, they they have names. You know, you can easily identify them. They have different. Uh, they have different, you know, uh, control panels that you can identify. You can, you know, purchase them on the web. Now, the traffic distribution systems are a little harder to find. Uh, there's a few very common ones like Sutra TDS, uh, things like that. But normally, these are ran as software uh, as a service sort of models. Uh, basically, you pay for a certain amount of traffic. It goes to these things. They send you traffic. Uh, so. What we ended up doing was doing a little bit of a deep dive on this thing called Video Ad Banner. Uh, and we noticed that there was like four stages of this TDS. Um, and this was pretty explicitly optimized for the malvertising. Uh, you know, the first stage was this index.php. The next stage was you would be redirected to this uh, form. And it was this banner.js. And then the third and fourth stage, basically what happened was it pops you over to Banner. And then it sends you off to this video.php. And then what it would do is redirect you to an exploit kit. Uh, and sometimes these exploit kits would, would be different. Uh, but we knew this was a, a kind of a paid for service uh, you know, based off of all these different uh, indicators. And we saw this coming through a lot of different websites. Uh, I'll go through it real quick. We saw um, you know, evidence of this redirection service back in March of 2014. So this thing's been going on for a while. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because most folks don't talk about it. Uh, you know, they talk about the exploit kits, they talk about the sites that are hacked, uh, they don't really talk about what goes in between. So it's kind of interesting. At least from my perspective, I hope. I hope I'm not boring everyone else. <laughs> so we knew that, you know, back to March and April of 2014, that they had a bunch of different websites. What we ended up doing was we tracked down through some of our data, since we have this huge crawling infrastructure, we have all sorts of IP to DNS data, and we were able to kind of trace the IPs as well as the uh, name servers that they use. We were able to find the Whois registration uh, information because we do a lot of Whois lookups as well. 
And we were able to kind of track this static infrastructure. What we were noticing was the infrastructure stayed the same. So this traffic redirection system uh, basically was up all the time. And you know, to our points earlier with Google Safe Browsing, what they would do is they would block the exploit kit. You know, the exploit kit is blocked, but this thing that's driving the traffic to the exploit kit never gets blocked. So this thing stays up for months and months and months. And it just keeps sending all this nasty traffic to all these different places. And there was probably like, uh, we noticed like a ton of different infrastructure. I, I, I'd have to look up all the stats on uh, on that. Like we noticed like with this specific infrastructure, there was at least like 35 domains that were using for the actual TDS itself. Um, you know, most of the domains were actually through GoDaddy registration, and they didn't have privacy protection, which is kind of nice because we can, uh, you know, find other domains that are registered with the same email or uh, potentially the same name. We also noticed that the infrastructure was hosted. I'm sorry for uh, not having this uh, in a more clear uh, manner, but we noticed the infrastructure was hosted pretty much in the same place as well. So. They were using a lot of lease web. Uh, they were using like secured servers, uh, Namecheap, stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it was kind of interesting. So it was really, really easy for us to track. Uh, and the other thing that we noticed was there was a huge amount of cloud components. So these guys were actually using uh, Amazon AWS S3 for their hosting. Uh, so what was happening was you're hosting these redirection services to all these you know different bad actors so basically right here what we see is this is the the uh, you know part of the traffic uh, redirection service and basically what they did was this initial uh, part was used to send the ads in so this right here was the TDS but this is how they got the ads in there and it was basically um, in this particular example um, these these malicious ads with um, Angular exploit kit were run on Huffington Post. So, um, you know, it, it, it was kind of interesting. You know, these are large websites that were serving up malware to their, all of their users uh, that, were, that were vulnerable. It's possible. Yeah. Do, does this make sense as far as the exploit chain, what they're doing here? And it's really about redirection. This is the middle tier, what we're calling the TDS, the traffic direction ser service, is like the business logic layer. You know, the back end is the exploit, you know, the front end is the presentation. And these middle tiers, they're using, you know, Amazon to make it initially look good. And then they have all these layers. So basically, you know, a tool looking at every call in line would, would see the call chain. But if you're out there crawling the web or trying to monitor for this stuff dynamically on your own websites, you know, et cetera, you have to build a DOM and emulate a full user and, and be there. You have to be in the bad neighborhood when the bad activity happens. And you have to be able to walk the whole call chain like a real user in a real browser would, which is why other scanners can have. If you're not building a DOM and doing this, you, you'll never see this other stuff like a user would. Yeah. So this is like, this kind of like redirection chains, are these, is this legit behavior for legit ads, or is so, this stuff that you only see in bad? Like I like set a CSP for my ad and say, when I'm surveying an ad in iframe, and you can't leave ads.yahoo.com. Yeah, so there's, the there's actually a few different things, um, you know, that you can do, like, you know, some of the CSP and then, like the script execution stuff. Um, you know, the big problem is folks use JavaScript down the line in these ads so much, uh, they use it for like anti-fraud, that it's almost impossible to get an advertising uh, company to buy your inventory if you're restricting how they're tracking everything. Uh, because they're just gonna assume that you're doing some sort of fraud. So, you know, it becomes really difficult until like there's some sort of browser implementation that gives us the flexibility to, you know, allow tracking but disable uh, things that are outside of, uh, you know, specific, because you would have to have CSP on every single component here, you know, that basically says, don't touch my DOM, like, don't, don't, like, play with it, so, uh, it's, it's very difficult. In this example, you could just block AWS. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is like right legitimate ad inventory going to yeah. yeah. Then you have another problem. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Why it doesn't yeah. work for people. So, so I mean, like in this example, um, what this is is actually there was an R two B, so a real time bid that was one, uh, and that's why you see the redirection back to Yahoo uh, and then the malicious ad service. So, 
Uh, and I can answer questions later on if, if folks want to hit me up on, on those specific instances. I can go through some of our data and hopefully give people a better understanding. So, um, okay. I, I'm going to blow through these. Um, these are just some of the other infrastructure that we saw that was used with this. Uh, and one of the other things that we did notice with this is it wasn't just, um, you know, exploit kits that were being used. Uh, you know, there was things like Windows may be running slowly, you know, fix your Windows installation. And basically on one side they're infecting a guy, and then on the other side they're trying to like uh, sell him some sort of uh, thing that will fix his Windows box. So. You know, this is... This is like again, Microsoft got the AD. So, I mean, this is just another example of AWS being used uh, inside these ads uh, that, that were malicious. Um, if folks, I, I've got like basically about five minutes left. Uh, are we good for a brief example? What's our, who's, who's time check in the room? Yeah, what's, what are we at? We have it till so the other one doesn't start at 245. Yeah, it does start at 245. Right, so we have what, 10 minutes then? Okay. I'm going to briefly burn through this example real quick then. Um, and I'm going to bring up that, that live example of um, just just kind of the multiple tiers. Uh, just to bring up what's. Uh, yeah. So right here, um, basically you have this, this is a publisher's website, right? Uh, they're selling the ad inventory, uh, and then what we have here is an ad server. So if you can imagine, we're working basically uh, right to left uh, on this, you know. Uh, a user would go here, they would be displayed an ad, and right here they're selling it through their ad server. Then what happens is it goes to an exchange. And this exchange then sells their inventory uh, to these guys, this ad host net right here. And then pretty much from here down is malicious. So in this example, what's going on here is you have a malicious advertiser. It's very simple. Uh, they pretty much went to this ad host net and they said, hey, I'm an advertiser. I want to I buy ads from you guys. You know, I want to advertise my product. And boom, malware inside the page. They either didn't do any scanning or something like that uh, on this ad host net. And then they sold it at an exchange and then the publisher displayed it on its website. So it, it's kind of a really straightforward example of how these work. And you can kind of see, um, so in this we have a sequence overview. If I were to pull up the actual, um, you know, like all the different pages, there's like literally hundreds of resources on here. and. With this, we can actually like see exactly what was requested by uh, which component. So, um, hopefully, that helps folks kind of understand a little better um, with that. Um, and I'm really not going to go any further. So, uh, I figured I'd ask folks if there's any questions at this point. So, let's turn it over to questions. As, as the end, somebody is handing over money, buying ads, and saying, "Here's my malware. I've split." Why, yeah. why can't that be tracked back? So the big problem is it can be if there's some sort of accounting issue. Now the ad, you know, like we alluded to earlier, you know, this whole ecosystem wasn't designed for security in place. So there isn't somebody out there that's going, are you who you say you are? Uh, you know, there aren't those sorts of things. And if you go to an advertising agency, and you sell ads directly to, you know, you say, here's $1,000, I want you to run this content. 
a lot of times the ad agency is going like, hey man, I need to make my, my commission. I don't really care if this guy is really who he says he is. And there's no regulation right now that basically says uh, who's responsible or who's liable for any of that, uh, that bad ad. So well, I'm you, sure it's a, a lot like the hosting where it's yeah. stolen credit cards and... There, there is some of that, is but, that but honestly, um, what's happening a lot is folks have the traffic distribution systems, and what you'll see is the traffic distribution systems will buy the ad space, and then they basically sell uh, traffic from these ads. So it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the traffic distribution guys, they can kind of go like, hey man, we didn't know that they were exploiting these guys, we're just selling traffic. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, what it is is really shady traffic, like traffic exchanges, where, you know, you're gonna share like, you know, 10,000 impressions between different sites. Like, there's a lot of that within the adult, uh, you know, industry where they basically share traffic between each other's sites. So the idea is, I I tell you that I'm going to put an iframe on my site, and you put an iframe on my site on your site, and we both basically double our traffic. Uh, so there are some sort of things like that that are somewhat legitimate, and I use that like with giant quoty fingers. You know? <laughs> I would never allow that. <laughs> let's, let's, so. So, so, in a nutshell, I think yeah. what you find is the vast majority of this marketplace is just starting to feel some impact and care. So you have, like, in finance and insurance, they've been burned by this. These things can lead to users having their AV or some corporate tool block them from using the site. And they say, oh, your site's infecting me, I can't get there. Then there's impact and loss. Then they're going back and walking this chain, going, who's who's burning my brand? Who is, who is infecting my internal users or compromising my customers and blocking them? Like once they're once that there's that pain point and people care, you know, and then their problem is well, there's not many tools to even find this and and find attribution. You have people like you know Huffington Post who probably don't really care, right? And all the people in between that are making a few cents or a few bucks off this, they're not being held accountable, so they don't really care. Like if there were a wall of shame out there and people knew like what's the top ten or if it got bad enough, the Huffington Post was in like blocked in Google safe browser, then they're they're gonna care. But until there's like a you know a wall of shame or as if you work with an organization that starts getting burned by this, you know, then you're gonna care and you're gonna start looking for your brand and these sort of attacks. Does that kind of make sense? So so it'll I think it'll help straighten itself out as it becomes more visible and more people get burned and start demanding accountability. But right now it's a it's 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 a new and exponentially growing frontier because of the lack of accountability. Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned that benign or legitimate ads use anti-fraud uh, done in JavaScript. Is that kind of custom per ads agency or something, or could that be at least whitelisted somehow? So the problem is it's very custom per ad agency. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the back end as well as the front end that basically verifies that it's a legitimate click uh, or a legitimate impression. Uh, and the problem is, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, every ad agency and ad exchange has their own secret sauce, and there's no incentive for them to work together. Uh, you know, because at that point, they're helping their competitors fight fraud. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's kind of one of these things where it's like, you know, if my if my ad exchange is like very fraud free, then I'm going to get more traffic. Uh, it's kind of a competitive advantage with people. So. And, and likewise, if people know what they're using to determine what's fraud, then you can cut it through. Exactly. And and to be completely honest, like, uh, is there anyone in the ad industry in here? Okay, I'm so sorry. I work at Facebook. So. Oh, okay. Well, you're okay. You guys, you guys are. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, like, you go to Affiliate Summit, which is one of the big uh, advertising uh, conferences, which just happened like last week. Uh, it is amazing what these guys think is like okay to do. I mean, like, these guys are basically going around and saying, like, well, they have my browser plugin, so they're my box, or you know, they're they're not your users anymore on Facebook. They're my users because they have my browser plugin, so I'm going to like plaster ads all over Facebook or something like that. Uh, and it's just amazing. So. 
And the, the same thing stands for the mobile ecosystem with the road mobile applications. And in general, the propping up, some of this stuff is also used to redirect the road web apps. So it's, again, it goes back to that question of you have things you only know about. Um, they probably aren't attacking your users and customers, hopefully. If they are, you've got a much, much bigger problem. There's things you own you don't know about that marketing is propped up. Hopefully those are okay and partner stuff. Then there's all this rogue stuff that's impersonating a brand. And tracking that is the exact same problem. And the, the hallmark of impersonating a brand, or that watermark usually indicates it's up to badness, which is targeting your users or customers with malware, with phishing, you know, at skimming money off the top of a transaction, etc. But for, for me, the way I conceptualize it is once you see these acts of impersonation going on, and that's your first sign that somebody's up to something bad that they're going to monetize, you know, or get your user creds and use that to get in. Uh, and I think there was one last question. Oh, yeah. I think we're done. yeah, just a quick comment. I think it actually is in the advertising industry's best interest to cooperate because the next step after that is a kind of a scorched earth, earth approach when they just start installing ad blockers. Agreed, and it, it, it's definitely, uh, the question was basically, or the comment was, you know, it is definitely in the ad industry's best interest. And do you have analytics on what percentage of ads are being served or are laced with malware? Um, so we do, but I don't have them in my head. Yeah, what, 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 oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that, we, we do, it's actually, so we were looking at trending it, but most of that data is relatively new. So about, like, ask us next year, and I think we'll be able to give much better data and trends. Uh, a lot of the signatures, as we figured out what they were doing, I mean, some of the signatures for this are as recent as September, December? Not uh, more, like, yesterday. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we're, we're still adding we signatures. Push, to, we push signatures, like, on a very consistent basis. But you brought up an interesting thing. You know, you've got the scorched earth. As this gets worse, people install ad blockers. I don't know what the percentage is. There's a lot of unsophisticated users who still don't and can't manage that. It's, but it's 12 million on like uh, like on Firefox's ad block. It's like 12, yeah. it's a lot. But of people on the internet, 12 million is still a fraction. But yeah, so 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 that grows. That's one way. The other thing you maybe think of is in terms of things you install client side. You know, I, I personally always have a dislike of uh, arbitrary code on it on my system, so toolbars always seemed evil to me, they slow down your system, but I never really thought about it much. And as we got into this and we're analyzing, you know, another lesson that I learned out of this, I didn't put up here, that if it's not obvious, toolbars are like from the devil. Like they're, they're evil, but they're worse than you think because some of these folks, so, so they want to hide. And one of the best ways they can hide from anybody trying to find them is with the toolbar. Uh, because then you have the toolbar installed, and, and we're not scanning the internet with the toolbar installed, but we're starting to now. And we don't publish details about the virtual user and the emulation we're doing. And the reason we're not publishing details is because if you're one of those people, uh, we don't want you to figure out like how we're finding you. But so we go around, well, one of the things they figured out is just get the toolbar in. And what they're doing is having this toolbar, when it hits the right site and the right ad, it'll dynamically download a piece of code, execute it, do whatever it is on your machine, then delete it, wipe the log file, and go back to a benign toolbar. So at any given point, if you do source code review on the toolbar, it's this totally benign, nice, safe, acceptable thing. It can get you know, passed. And, and we're expecting to see the same kind of things with, with the mobile apps, too. As they have trouble getting them in stores, they'll just put up benign apps, maybe especially in the Chromebook world, where they can dynamically update. But yeah, just keep in mind your toolbar could hit the right ad and trigger, download a piece of code, execute it, and the full privilege process of the browser, you know, dump and wipe that code. So when you go to do forensics later, there's like no trace of it. Do malware guys show up at places like this? Uh, I can tell you for a fact they do. Um, we've, we've had a couple of instances where... Good or bad? Or you asking? Bad. Yeah. Yeah, we... Um, we have seen on a few different mailing lists where uh, the malware authors are actually watching. Uh, I, I would be source. if I were them, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we've, we've actually seen where they're watching like open source signature stuff. Yeah. They're watching like you know places like Virus Total, like they're registered. They're like paying for little tiny accounts, uh, things like that. So it's it's definitely something that they do. And we've actually seen a couple of uh, Russian gangsters at like certain conferences in Eastern Europe. So, huh. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so I'm James and this is Arian. Uh, we're both at uh, Respect You. Thanks for your time.
and I still don't know if we do. <laughs> Yeah, we we saw it. We crossed the